All right, good morning, good morning, welcome. Thank you all for being here. Um, I've asked our elders to come out. We have a special announcement that we'd like to make this morning. It's an exciting announcement. Uh, we we're actually, uh, several months ago, um, we asked for input for, from many of you uh, regarding a new elder to serve on our board. And uh, one of our elders had moved to Washington, D.C., and so we needed to replace him. And so we asked for input from you, the congregation, and there were um, a couple of names that bubbled to the surface, and one that we interviewed and felt just was a perfect fit for cross points. So I am here to announce that we have a new elder serving um, on our board, and our elder board makes kind of the major decisions here in the church in terms of direction and all of those kind of things, and they're just wonderful men of God. And so I'm here to announce, I'd like you to give a warm welcome to Tom Hayes, our new elder at Cross Points Church. Uh, Tom has uh, been in the church for about 30 years and has served in many capacities, a small group leader and been on missions trips with me and uh, just uh, is a wonderful man of God. It's done just a tremendous uh, amount here in the church over the years. And so we're super excited to have him here with us this morning and to pray for him. Uh, before we do that, though, I've asked each of the elders just to uh, share a little bit about who they are this morning so that you get to know who the leadership is of the church. So I'm going to start with uh, Steve. Why don't you go ahead this morning? I'm Steve Van Buskirk. Uh, my wife and I, Teresa, she's not here right now. She's in an alms committee meeting, but we've been in, uh, at full faith since, since 1981. Well, good morning, church. My name is Jay Adams. My beautiful wife is sitting right there, and we've been married for many years. Oh, my gosh, I forgot how many. <laughs> but we, we have six children, 14 grandchildren, actually 15 will be in January, and 16 will be in June. And so uh, we've been part of this church since 1983. Good morning. My name is Don Lewis, and I've been a part of uh, this church, Full Faith Church of Love, Cross Points Church, since 2001. Uh, my wife, Hildred, is sitting over there to my left, and uh, we have four children, one in D.C., one in California, one in Houston, and one here. And we have our third grandchild was born just this past week. Good morning. I'm Jeff Rucker, and uh, my wife, Selena, was here at first service serving back in the children's ministry. Uh, we've been uh, back in Kansas City since 2008, and that's when we started attending Cross Points. Uh, we have five kids at home, ranging from ages 21 down to 15, and I serve on the worship team here as well. So. I'm Steve Rado. I've been here since I was about seven years old, so a long time. Um, and uh, my wife, Rachel, is sitting over here. And we have three kids, two of them you'll see often serving in the coffee shop, and another one on staff here. Great. So, Tom, why don't you say something? Yeah, let's put him up there. Well, my name's Tom Hayes, which you found out. I uh, actually got married in this church in 1977. Uh, I have five children and 18 grandchildren. Looking forward to a good Christmas. <laughs> That's great. Let's give them all a hand. Go ahead, come on up. Uh, we're going to pray and uh, have what we call an official installation service. This is just where we pray and ask God's blessing to rest upon Tom as he serves in this role with us. I uh, want to encourage uh, you as well to be praying for the leadership of the church, uh, all kinds of decisions that we make um, every single month as we gather together, and we so value your prayers and uh, just your support of us as well as we seek to hear from God and then just simply do what he calls us to do. So uh, would you mind stretching forth your hands just as a symbol of laying on of hands of Tom? And I've asked Steve uh, Van Buskirk to lead us in prayer this morning. Okay. Before we stretch forth your hands, I just uh, I would I did this in the first service. I'm compelled to do it again. I, I just want to say that uh, I've known Tom for a long, long time. Uh, there's few people that I respect and honor as much as him, and this is a, a, a really an honor and a privilege for me to be able to pray for him today. Amen. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for this man and his faithfulness. Lord, I believe he's the final piece to a puzzle that you have put together. And I believe that it's because of his faithfulness and your faithfulness that we're here this morning. So Lord, we ask that uh, 
you use the gifts that you've given him mm -hmm. to bring additional wisdom, mm -hmm. additional faithfulness, and a new level of commitment for all of us to the elder board. Lord, we thank you for this man. We thank you for what he's meant to this church, for what he will mean to this church mm -hmm. in the coming years. Lord, we just ask that you would use him according to your purposes to accomplish your purposes in this body. And we praise you for it this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Let's give all these guys a great big hand for serving here at the church. Thank you so much. All right. We really are blessed with um, these guys that just serve so faithfully year after year after year, and uh, we're just real blessed to have uh, men of such great caliber, and uh, so you're blessed as well. Um, this morning, uh, I want to chat just a little bit with you about um, some things that um, I believe that you all have done as a church body, that as a pastor, I get so super excited about. Um, just over the last couple of weeks, uh, you as a church have done some really amazing, incredible things, and I always like to celebrate some of the great things that God has done through this church. And uh, one of the things that we've done is that we've asked you as a church body to help support some of the families in uh, Johnson County and in, Can and in Wyandotte County uh, to support some of the families who wouldn't ordinarily have a what we would call a merry and bright Christmas. Some of these that are maybe misfortunate families, maybe some families that don't have the needed funds to have a merry and bright Christmas. And we asked you to sponsor uh, a no actually dozens and dozens of families here not only in Johnson County but in Wyandotte County as well. And uh, we had you sponsor kids. And um, I was so impressed because we've helped kids at uh, Lindbergh Elementary in Kansas City, Kansas, uh, Blue Jacket Flint right here in Shawnee, uh, Hawker Grove Middle School here in Shawnee as well, and uh, then even beyond that to some of the other uh, families here in our community. And you guys went above and beyond what we even asked. Um, there were a number of families that we had, and all of them were sponsored by you. And so we had some of the uh, principals from the school district said, hey, if you can take on some more families, we have more for you to give. And so uh, we actually got extra names, and you guys came and uh, sponsored them as well. Uh, we had an office uh, back here in the back here that was loaded with wrapped presents. I mean, it was like Christmas exploded in the office. It was all over everywhere. There was even a big bike that was there that we were giving away. And it's just a wonderful thing for you guys to uh, step up and, uh, and allow other families to have a merry and bright Christmas. And I just want to say, as your pastor, thank you so very much. And if that wasn't enough, um, last week I asked that we needed 75 people to come and help with Shawnee Community Services uh, to help with the Christmas carnival that they were having for hundreds and hundreds of kids that were going to show up. And yesterday, uh, we had um, over, I had asked for 75, we had over 100 volunteers from this church show up uh, on Saturday and work and smile and share and take pictures and clean up and do all kinds of things. And I just wanted to say thank you so much on behalf of uh, the six or 700 kids that showed up yesterday that received gifts and food and prizes and all kinds of stuff. Can you guys just give Jesus a great big hand for allowing us to be the light of the world? Yeah, just you guys did a great job. So thank you so much for volunteering, being part of the community. Church isn't just about a building. It's not about just coming in the sanctuary and lifting up our hands and singing and hearing a word. As important as those things are, it's being uh, those that are a light to the world, that we actually go out into the community and shine the light and love of Jesus. And you all have done that this Christmas season. And I, my heart just really overflows uh, with gratitude to all of you. So thank you so much. Uh, well, this morning... Uh, we're going to be talking about Jesus being the light of the world, and he's the reason for a merry and bright Christmas. So I ask this question um, almost every Sunday. How many of you are here because you believe that God speaks and he wants to speak to you? Would you just lift up your hands if you want to hear from God today? And I want to pray for you. Father, I thank you for these hands that are lifted high. Lord, they recognize and understand that you speak today, and they're asking that you would communicate to them. So God, I pray, would you open up our eyes 
and open up our ears that we might hear from heaven today. God, we love you and we thank you for being so good to us. In Jesus' name, and the church said, amen. Amen, amen, amen. Well, uh, we're celebrating Christmas in our communities and in our homes, and oftentimes when we think about Christmas, we think about the lights, and we think about the Christmas tree and decorating the Christmas tree. How many of you have already decorated your Christmas tree? Anybody out there that waits till Christmas Eve to get their, I've heard a couple of people kind of do that as a tradition, yeah, Um, and uh, put up lights in your house and all over, and we think sometimes about the snow, and although we've had nice weather, we haven't had to worry about that. Uh, We think about the snow, and we think about all the get-togethers and all the food that we have. Anybody uh, attended any Christmas parties with amazing food yet? A couple of you have. I love pecan pie with a slice, with a uh, scoop of ice cream on top. Does anybody like the pecan? Yeah, okay, there's a, some of you. You either love it or hate it. That's what I have found about pecan pie, and I just love it. Uh, just some wonderful, wonderful things. But when we think about Christmas, it's not just the get-togethers and the food and the lights and the Christmas tree. Uh, when I think about Christmas, the main thing that I think about, except, of course, obviously, the birth of Jesus, I think about the music of Christmas, the songs of of Christmas, that we're able to turn on our radio stations and listen to Christmas music 24 hours a day. Anybody listen to those radio stations that just love to listen and hit and just hear their songs over and over and over? Um, I think about the songs of Christmas, and the songs of Christmas are so impactful. I think about the songs that we hear uh, throughout the week, and, and the, the, the number one top Christmas song last week, I looked this up, was... Um, uh, was a song by uh, Mariah Carey. Anybody know the song? Think about it. Merry Christmas. No? Nobody? It's the number. All, I heard it. I just heard it. All I want for Christmas is, is you. Yeah, there you go. Okay. All I want for Christmas is you. Number one song last week. We think about all these different songs. Uh, we think about some of the classic songs like Bing Crosby's White Christmas. Anybody know Mele Keliki Maka? Do you guys know that song? Yeah, I, I used to play that all the time as a kid. Mele Keliki Maka. Yeah, no? Okay, it's a Hawaiian thing. It's a lot of fun. Uh, so that's a great song. We think about White Christmas, Bing Crosby. How many of you like the Charlie Brown Christmas, like that instrumental? Oh, that just makes me think of Christmas right there. And then uh, we think about another song that is honestly probably the uh, most owned classical music uh, by people all over the world. And it was written by a man named George Frederick Handel, Handel's Messiah. How many of you ever heard of Handel's Messiah before, ever have gone through that? Well, George Frederick Handel composed this music called the Messiah, and maybe some of you might not recognize it, but I wanted you to hear it this morning. Oh, now, it's ringing a bell, isn't it? There we go. Okay, great. I want, it's two hours and like 19 minutes long. This, this whole kind of uh, music piece that George Frederick Handel put together. It's an amazing story because um, he um, actually uh, went into his room. He had read this, this uh, composition, this, they call it a, the text uh, of this music piece that and it was over 250 pages long. And he read it, and instantly he knew he had to put music to it. So he went into his room, and uh, he had an assistant come and bring him meals. And for 23 days, he was in his room composing this music. He um, wrote over 250,000 notes to this music. 
uh, the, uh, some statisticians have, have determined that he had to write for 10 hours a day over that 23-hour period, and every single minute he had to compose 15 different notes. 250,000 notes, a quarter of a million notes in order to make this piece come to life. It was an absolutely amazing, musical, kind of genius thing. And when he had this um, music uh, come out, um, it was performed in Dublin, and immediately one of the first performances um, uh, tradition has it that the king was so moved by this music that he stood up because he was so overcome by the beauty and the grandeur and the glory of this music. And so as a result of the king standing, everybody else stood as well because you were to stand in the presence of the king if the king was standing. And um, so it is a tradition now over 200 some odd years that at the beginning of the Hallelujah Chorus, that piece that I just played, which uh, just finishes at the, uh, at the end of the second act, everybody stands up. And I was thinking about this idea and this concept, and that is that songs often prompt a response. That when we hear music, there's this response that often comes out of us. It it prompts something in us to take action, to do something. And with Handel's Messiah, the king was so moved that he had to stand up. So I wonder with you, and I wonder with me, What kind of response are you prompted to when you hear music? And I was thinking about the classic Christmas story in Luke chapter 2. And I was thinking about the original Christmas song that the shepherds heard 2,000 years ago. And I wanted to walk you through this. In Luke chapter 2, he writes and he says that that night there were shepherds staying out in the fields nearby guarding their flocks of sheep. Now, I want you to stop there just for a second because it's important to set the stage. We've heard this a million times, probably every single Christmas you've heard this story, but I want you to understand that in the middle of the evening, it was pitch black, the shepherds were out there, and they were staying in the fields outside. They were camping out, so to speak, and they were guarding their sheep. Now, you need to understand this, that the shepherds at the time, they were the outcasts of Jewish society. They were the lowest of the low. Uh, Shepherds were looked upon as sinners and thieves and swindlers. Uh, They were the ones who would often take their sheep into places that they weren't supposed to go. They would eat the produce of the land, move on, steal things, and whenever the shepherds would come through, people were on their guard. They were looked upon as sinners and thieves and swindlers, so much so that they were not even able to go into the temple at the time because they were so looked down upon. Uh, One Jewish historian writes, and he says that, Even the pious, the the holy ones in in Israel at the time, were warned not to buy wool or milk from shepherds on the assumption that it was stolen property. These shepherds were the dregs of society. They were the ones that lived outside for months and months at a time. And they were not highly valued or highly esteemed. They were looked down upon. They were the weak and the lost, the ones that people pushed to the fringes of society. And here they are guarding their sheep in the middle of the evening. And here we come to the most important passage in Luke chapter 2. It says this, that suddenly... In a moment, suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them, and they were terrified. I want you to understand, they weren't terrified necessarily because of the bright light. They weren't necessarily terrified because the angel stood in front of them, although I'm sure that scared them half to death. But I believe the thing that they were most worried about when they saw that angel and they realized that they were having a visitation from God himself, that when he was there in the midst of them, the first thing that came to their mind is that God has come to judge us. That God has come to take us out. That God is displeased with us because we're sinners, we're the dregs of society, and we've crossed a line that God is now going to punish us. I think that's the first thing that came to their minds. And I believe this, 
that God sings to the least and to the lost. That he sent his angels, his angelic warriors to come and in the midst of of the least and the lost, in the midst of those that are broken and hurting, the ones that are on the fringes of society, the ones that have sinned and messed up and screwed up with their lives, these are the ones to whom God sends his angelic messengers. And I want you to check this out. The angel, I think, knowing what is flashing through their minds, believing that they're going to be incinerated by these angels, the angel says, but the angel reassured them and said, don't be afraid. I think that's a beautiful message at Christmas. Don't be afraid. I don't know where you are right now in your walk with the Lord, or your relationship with God. I'm not sure where you are. Maybe you feel like everything is great and life is going well and you're going to have a Merry Christmas and, and you're, you get kind of enraptured and enthralled into the music of Christmas and, and it just makes you feel good. And, but maybe there's some of you here today and you feel like those shepherds. You feel like you crossed a line that God could never forgive you. That when you hear about the Christmas music and you hear the story, the first thing that comes to your mind is that God has come to judge me, that he could never accept me, that he could never really love me. I can't really be myself because I, I'm too afraid of all the bad things that I've done in my life that God could never accept me. And I want to tell you this very clearly this morning, that when God sent his angelic messengers to those shepherds, the least and the lost, the sinners, the swindlers and the thieves, I want you to know that God comes to you this morning, wherever you find yourself, no matter how depressed or depraved you are, I want you to know that God comes down today and he wants to sing songs of joy over you. That he's come to save you, not to destroy you. He's come to rescue you out of the pit of hell. He's come to save you and to fill you with his joy and his life and his light. And the angel's message to the shepherd is to you today, don't be afraid. He said, look, and he continues and he said, I bring you good news not bad news. I haven't come to destroy you. I've come to bring good news of great joy. What's the great joy? The great joy is going to be to all people because the Savior, the Savior, yes, the Messiah, the one you've been waiting for for hundreds and hundreds of years, the Jewish people have been waiting for a Messiah that had been prophesied hundreds of years before. They had given up and lost hope and felt like God wasn't with them that he was not intervening in their lives, that he had left them to be by themselves, that God had forgotten about them. And I think sometimes many of us feel the same way. God, where are you? What are you doing? I don't sense your presence anymore. God, I don't hear your voice. You're not speaking to me. Things aren't going well for me. I don't have the financial resources that I need or my family is in turmoil and my kids are far away from me. They don't want to have anything to do with me and there's all this conflict that's going on and we feel like God has forgotten us. That's how the shepherds felt 2,000 years ago, that God had abandoned them. But the angelic message was that today, has been born the Savior, the Messiah, the Rescuer, the Redeemer, the Holy One, the Chosen One, the One who is the light of the world. He's been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And then what happens, we find in verse 12, is something kind of takes a left turn. And the angel says, and this is how you're going to recognize him. He's not going to be born in a palace, not going to be born in a mansion. You're going to recognize him by this sign. And I'm sure this messed with their minds. You're going to find a little baby. He's going to be wrapped snugly in strips of cloth. And he's going to be lying in a feed trough in a manger. I'm sure they were scratching their heads. How could the Savior, Messiah, Redeemer, the Holy One, the Chosen One, the one that we've been waiting for hundreds of years, he's going to be born in a feeding trough? scratching their heads going, is this real? And it's at that moment that suddenly the angel was joined by a vast host of others. If, 
it, as if to stamp this, just to, to make sure that these shepherds understood that, yes, this baby was going to be born in a feeding trough, that something was going to be different about him, that there was this vast host of others, and the armies of heaven, I love this, these are not just sweet little angels that are playing a harp. These are God's mighty warriors. These are the angelic hosts of heaven, the armies of heaven that are now uh, in the sky and all around them, and they're praising God, and they're singing. And they're not just singing. They're shouting and chanting. It's, it's almost like a military chant. Glory to God in the highest. Glory to God in the highest. And the chant gets louder and deafening. Glory to God in the highest. And peace on earth. You can just feel it come through you. And I'm sure the shepherds were absolutely terrified hearing all of this. But yet with a sense of wonder and awe at what God was doing. The glory to God in the highest heaven. And peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. Oh. What a beautiful, amazing moment that they had. You see, I believe that God tends to show up when we least expect it. At the moment when we're at our darkest, at the moment when we're out with the, with the sheep in the fields and we are discouraged and depressed and on the fringes of society and wherever you find yourself, I want you to know that God tends to show up when you least expect it. I want you to know today that God has never left you. He's never forsaken you, that he's right there with you, that he wants to save you and rescue you and redeem you and, and set you right in your heart. God wants to save you, not destroy you. No matter where you find yourself today, God loves you, and he shows up oftentimes when we least expect it. The shepherds weren't expecting anything that night. George Frederick Handel, when he wrote The Messiah, you need to know the backstory. Three years before this, he had suffered a stroke. He was paralyzed on his right side. He was right-handed. He was unable to compose. He was unable to perform. He was unable to conduct. Everything went south for him after that stroke. So much so that he lost all of his money, was into great debt. He was depressed and discouraged and lonely and all by himself. No one wanted to have anything to do with him. He had basically come to a point in his life where he gave up and stopped composing. He was 53 years old, and he felt like life had passed him by. But then there was a suddenly moment in his life. One of his friends came to him and said, I've just written this piece, and I want you to put it to music. It was over 250 pages. It was broken down into three different parts. The first part was the prophecy of the Messiah. The second part was the birth and the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That was the, the second part. And at the end of that second part was this, was this hallelujah. And then the beginning of the third part was the end days, the, the reigning king of Jesus the Messiah coming to claim his throne and defeating Satan, sin, and death. And as George Frederick Handel began to, to read this, this poetry, he, he knew instantly that God had called him for such a time as this to write this piece of music. And that's when he secreted away into his room. What you need to know about this is that he rarely ate the food that the assistants brought to him. Over those 23 days, he was fasting and writing and composing a quarter of a million different notes, and he was writing furiously. And towards the, the, the end of his composition, his assistant comes in, and he sees that George Frederick Handel, his, his eyes are, are wet with tears, and, 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 and he says, is everything all right? And George Frederick Handel looks at him and he says, I saw the heavens open up. And I saw the face of God. And then he begins to compose some more and finish the piece. This piece, the Messiah, has been played countless times throughout the centuries. But the first performance, I think, is one of the most important. It was conducted in Dublin, Ireland. It, it wasn't a success at first, George Wesley, who was the father of the Methodist movement, he was 
uh, one that was able to see one of the first performances, and he wrote in his journal, he said, well, this piece doesn't have much staying power. It won't be around that long. But that night in Dublin, George Frederick Handel did something that was pretty profound. There was a response that came from the music. Even though he himself was in debt, and he was on the verge of being sent to debtor's prison himself, he decided to give all the proceeds that night to help those less fortunate than him. And they raised enough money that night that they released 126 men from debtor's prison as a result of that music. There is a response that comes from music. And the shepherds that night, the response that they had to the music is so profound for each and every single one of us. It, it demands a response. And this is how the shepherds responded when they heard this angelic music from the hosts of heaven. It says that when the angels returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, let's go, let's go. They didn't just hear this music, they responded to it. They said, let's go. They didn't just say, well, that was nice. That was some beautiful music. I feel good. They were like, no, we want to go beyond it. We're going to go. Let's go. Let's see. Let's actually see it with our own eyes, this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. And so they hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph. And there was the baby lying in the manger. And after seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about the child. I love this. The shepherd's response to the angelic message was, let's go, let's see it, and let's tell everyone what God has done. My challenge to you this morning is what is your response to the message of Jesus, of the Christmas music that we hear every single moment in the grocery store, in Target, in Walmart, on the radio, wherever we are, it's the one time of the year where we hear Jesus and his name and hallelujah and hosannas and go tell it on the mountains. These are the kind of music that we hear. The world is ripe and ready to hear the good news. Are you willing to be like the shepherds 2,000 years ago to respond by telling everyone what God has done for you. That's the question I have today. And I want to leave you with a challenge today. That we have some information that I would love for you to pass out. This is a real practical message. Here's what I'm asking you to do. I would love for you to invite your neighbor beside you on the right or to the left or the neighbor in front of you. Your neighbors, I would love for you to invite them to our Christmas Eve candlelight service. Our services are going to take place this coming Saturday at 5 o'clock and then next Sunday at 3 and 5. I want you to invite your neighbors to come because I believe if they come, they'll hear the angelic music of heaven and their hearts will be changed. Because God didn't come to destroy the world, he came to save the world. And you, whether you know it or not, if you receive Jesus in your life, Jesus said, you're the light of the world. You're called to be like a light that's on the hill. You're called to shine your light wherever you go. And I think this is the easiest way for you to do what Jesus has already called you to do, that you're the light of the world. Invite someone to come for Christmas Eve. I promise you they'll hear the gospel message. They'll hear some beautiful singing. They'll hear some drama. They'll, they'll, they'll see some beautiful things that'll take place. And who knows? Maybe they'll be like one of those shepherds whose life was turned from darkness to light, from thievery and swindling to a world that was completely turned upside down. You have that opportunity and I want to encourage you. We have a table in the back after the service. Would you go back, grab a couple of these, maybe put a plate of cookies, take it to your neighbor and invite him to come. I promise you, their world will be turned upside down. 
We also have a couple of other opportunities for you as well. We're going to go Christmas caroling. As a church, if you'd like to join us on Tuesday night, we're going to go caroling. And if you would like more information, you can find it back uh, there in the back. We'll give you more information about where to meet. But we're focusing on a zip code this year as a church, 66218. And uh, we're sending out postcards and information. We've had our evangelism team go out there. We're actually going to be having uh, our women's group on Wednesday. They're going to go and they're going to pray and they're going to invite people. If you'd like to join them on Wednesday night, uh, you can find out more information in the back. It's just going to be a, a lovely time where we're trying to shine the light of Jesus because we believe that the darkness can never extinguish the light. That Jesus has called us. He's called you. He's called me to be the light of the world to those that live in darkness. Would you close your eyes with me this morning, church? There may be some of you here today that You've never received the light of Jesus. You've never experienced the good news. You've never accepted Jesus Christ in your life. Maybe you feel like you're the shepherd. You're the thief, the swindler. Maybe you've crossed that line that you feel like no one could ever forgive. I want you to know today that Jesus didn't come to destroy you. Jesus came to save you. Jesus came to give you hope and life and peace. And he simply asked you one thing. He wants all your life. He wants you to give him the control of your life. And as you do that, he'll infuse you with purpose and peace like you've never experienced it. I wonder today, who would be willing to raise their hand and say, yeah, that's me. I need Jesus in my life. I need to have him come in and to forgive me of all the things that I've done wrong and to do something new in my life. Anybody that would just say, yeah, I want to raise my hand and say, yeah, that's me. See that one hand over there. Anybody else that would say, yeah, I need Jesus. I see that hand right there. Anybody else that would say, yeah, I need him in my life. I think it's the most amazing thing that you could do this Christmas season. Receive Jesus into your life. Amen. Let's pray. There were two of you that raised your hand this morning. We want to pray together as a church family. You're going to ask Jesus to come into your life, and he's going to turn you upside down, give you peace and purpose like you've never had before. Would you just join with me together? We're going to pray together. The whole church is going to pray. You're going to join with me. You're going to make this your prayer. Maybe you didn't raise your hand, but man, you want to give your life to Christ. Would you just join with us in this prayer? Just repeat after me. Say, Jesus, I need you. Forgive me for my sins. I believe you died on the cross. That you rose again to give me new life. Come into my life. Come into my heart. I turn from my wicked ways. And I'm going to follow you all the days of my life. I receive you, Jesus. In your name I pray. And just receive the Spirit of God right now. He's coming into your life and filling you with His goodness, His peace, and His purpose. Amen, amen. Can we give these a great big hand? Let's welcome you now to the family of God. Thank you so much. Amen. Praise God. If you raise your hand and you'd like to get more information about what it means to be a believer in Jesus, I'd love to meet with you right here up front after the service. I can just give you a few steps, some next steps would tell you how to have a, a wonderful relationship with Jesus Christ. Everybody else, would you mind just standing this morning? If you'd like prayer this morning, we believe in prayer that God hears prayer. Uh, over to my left and your right, we have a prayer team that will be there after the service. They'd love to pray with you and encourage you this morning. Make your way over there. They'd be glad to pray with you. Um, also, if you're new to Cross Points and you'd like to learn a little bit more about who we are as a church, uh, we have this thing called our Grow Class. It's a 30 minute class. We have a free lunch for you. We'd love to have you come. Just a way of learning a little bit more about who we are as a church. It's a class I teach. I'd love to, love to have you come back and just get to know you a little bit better. You can meet us over by our, our uh, coffee house right over there. There's a banner that says Grow. There'll be some leaders there that'll help you direct you to where the lunch is. We'd be glad to have you and uh, just get to know you just a little bit better. Well, everybody else, if you wouldn't mind just lifting up your hands, it's our tradition here, a way of receiving God's blessing in your life. 
Father, I pray that you bless your people, that they would be the light of the world, that you would shine through them this week. God, I pray that we would point people to you. And God, I pray that we would hear the song of heaven this week and that we would respond in a joyful manner to those around us. In Jesus' name, and everybody that wanted that, shout it out. Amen. Amen. Have a great Sunday. God bless you.